This Saturday, April 2nd at 7.30 at St. Andrew's United Church, the Virtuosi Concert Series will be welcoming back to Winnipeg the Griffin Trio. Regular listeners to Classic 107 will be familiar with the Griffins. They are, in fact, have become the de facto piano trio here for Classic 107. They're the in-house piano trio, and for good reason. The recordings are just fantastic. This Saturday night's concert is called Homage à Harry. The concert pays tribute to longtime virtuosi artistic director Harry Strub, and the concert will feature music of Shostakovich, Beethoven, and the Ukrainian composer Valentin Silvestrov. And joining me here over Zoom, I am joined by Roman Boris, cellist for the Griffin Trio and pianist James Parker. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. Hi, good to see you, Chris. Great nice to see you. Here. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I want to, first of all, start out the conversation with asking about what these past two years have been like. I know that all three members of the Griffin Trio are members, uh, are on faculty at the University of Toronto, but have you been working on any side projects since there have been few performances and few concerts? Roman, you want to start, yeah. start us out with that? Yeah, no, definitely. You know, we, uh, our, our impulse right away in, in March of uh, 2020 was to just you know, get busy adapting, looking for opportunity. So we were very lucky that we already had uh, a nice relationship with a beautiful hall in Kingston. Um, and the lady that runs it, uh, Trisha Baldwin, uh, who uh, for many years uh, worked with Tafel Music as their executive director, and um, essentially oversaw the the building of this this Norwegian designed. Actually, it's the same architect that designed the 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 Opera House in Oslo, and it is just this. I mean, we couldn't have asked for a greater gift. Um, this gorgeous. We've recorded there many times, so many of the recordings, uh, recent recordings that you've been, uh, that you're referring to, we recorded there. Um, the, it's a gorgeous place. You know, it's just a couple of hours away from Toronto, mm-hmm. um, and basically, Trisha and the Isabel Bader um, Center for for the Performing Arts team uh, quickly pivoted um, in the early pandemic days to uh, fully equip themselves to um, broadcast absolutely first rate live stream concerts from that stage so that was our lifeline uh, to begin with you know we we started there in may of 2020 and you know it's just worth mentioning as well that that days before the march shutdown um they took delivery of a brand new german steinway which was so jamie was the first you know to break this beautiful piano in to play it in and so we had a number we we so we we had these concerts eventually they started letting some people in uh we were we commissioned new works uh dinok vigerantne wrote us a, a short piece that we premiered there we commissioned um new visuals um that were uh created by uh armenian syrian um artist from new york uh kevork murad amazing amazing sort of technique that that typically he does live at performances and it's incredible to see so we did that we we um you know we also wear a whole hat at the Banff center as directors of the classical music summer programs and you know all our plans for the summer of 2020 were just canceled outright and there just wasn't even discussion about you know about doing anything so we uh, were very lucky that the indigenous leadership team there um just took the opportunity to cast a line, an invitation um, to all Banff Center uh, in staff, employees, directors, what have you, to participate in a weekly conversation uh, that was entitled Centering Indigenous Wisdom. And that was actually an incredible experience for us in a real kind of unexpected um life experience um i will say because it's it's as artists we're very sensitive to the issues you know around us it's our job actually to to to, you know in in some ways to kind of provide you know reactions to all sorts of things and we've you know with uh with the need you know bipoc conversations diversity equity um all of these discussions um in a way we were given an opportunity to kind of weigh in and lean into through the centering indigenous wisdom and it was it was actually mostly just listening for months 
on Amazing. a weekly basis. And they, and what it led to was uh, the creation of some new relationships and friendships and collaborations. So, uh, and one in particular, which is worth noting because um, it uh, involved, uh, well, we, we, we launched this new project eventually called Echoes. Um, and uh, well, we launched the development of it, and and um, it's, it brings together a, a number of artists that are indigenous and non-indigenous, both from Canada, Norway, and further afield even. And we just started developing this project. We had a, a first workshop um, last October. We're going to have a whole other workshop um, this coming summer, and we hope to be premiering the piece in, in possibly in exactly a year from today uh, in Toronto. And in the piece, basically, um, uh, explores the whole nature of memory, uh, of memory born, memory suppressed, memory passed on um, to the future. And it's, it's so there's a, there's another theme that I think we're all sort of, you know, kind of um, you know, very much emanating from the, the, the times we live in. Jamie, some thoughts on all that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think you, you sort of summed that up terrifically. I mean, I would say for me personally, musically, um, you know, a typical day is that, you know, you know, I get up as late as I can and then I teach all day, come home, spend some time with family and dinner, and then, you know, have a quad espresso and practice roughly 9.30 to 2.30, you know, and that's that's yeah. sort of my typical day. And then, you know, when, when all of a sudden I don't have to relearn that one, that piece for Friday, I don't have to learn this piece for, you know, when when all of a sudden I had much more time and I found I found a couple of things, um, like in the early, early days of the pandemic, you know, and just seeing you know, this horrific death toll in, in, in Italy and in New York. And uh, I mean, I just, you know, I just, I needed Schubert. That, that, that's all I could deal with. And so I, just, you know, play through impromptus and Momo Musico. And that's, that's kind of what I needed, you know, and then, and then in the summer, again, you know, we got a few concerts, but nothing like a typical schedule and I'm not teaching. So, you know, I, I, I had the luxury of, you know, of having a job with a salary at U of T, which I'm very grateful for, but I mean, I could just, I, you know, I remember one day I just, you know, Bartok, I miss Bartok, you know, and I pulled off some, some big, you know, book that I bought and, you know, and just sort of slowly spent three hours reading through everything Bartok <laughs> wrote. And it, and it was great, you know, so, so it's been kind of, you know, it's, it's been very strange. I would say there have been moments I, quite frankly, I've enjoyed sort of a pause, you know, you know, mm -hmm. on sort of the regular, just the running around that, that professional musicians do, you don't realize how stupid it is until you actually are forced to stop and you go wow <laughs> i you know i don't i'm not in a constant state of panic and running around you know it's um so it's it's been it's been kind of strange you know but um but here we are you know we've, we've all you know shown a certain resilience to sort of navigate through this i am amazed every day at the resilience of our students who have had to deal with this for two years you know teaching on zoom okay limited in person back to zoom get ready oh no all your all your juries and concerts are canceled and you know they i'm just so impressed you know we've done everything we can to sort of you know nurture them and keep them going but um but but you know at the university years this is where you want to be exploring who you are and friendships relationships and all of that has just been snuffed out and so right. for them to persevere and, and and stick it out I I'm just so impressed with them. Oh, that's amazing and so now the the trio is back on the road and you're going to be here on Saturday night and you're paying tribute to Harry Strub. Um, James, can you uh, talk briefly about your relationship with Harry Strub, how long you've known him and uh, that kind of thing? We've known him a long time. I mean, I mean, our trio is all, you know, 20, 29 years. Um, and for a lot of that, we, we have known Harry. I mean, he was one of the earlier presenters that hired us. And then, you know, a few years later, we'd go back and then I, I might go back with with another violinist and then the trio would come back a couple years later. So he's been really a remarkable, a remarkable, uh, you know, I would say pivotal, you know, influence on our career. I mean, just giving us opportunities to play things. We've done cycles of Mozart or Beethoven trios. Um, and he's he's really been a, you know, a stalwart supporter of ours. And so. So we're sort of honored to you know dedicate this concert to Harry because of course when you when you go back a number of times a presenter becomes a friend and it's right. uh, it's it's really feelings of friendship that we have for people like like Harry Kathy and you know a lot of the audience that that, that we've come to know over the years in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So who picked uh, the works for Saturday night's concert? Was it Harry? 
Well, I, I, I think that Harry uh, very much did request um, the Shostakovich and the Archduke. Um, and we had uh, initially proposed uh, a piece by our very good friend, uh, Dinuk Vigerantne, uh, Love Triangle. Girl. And we are going to, we, we, we have a way that we're going to introduce that at, at the very end of the program, or at least a, a nice snippet of it. Um, and uh, the, the, the change, so, so the, the, certainly the Shostakovich uh, and the Archduke, I mean, definitely um, Harry's uh, amongst his favorite works, I think, in, in the piano trio um, literature. Certainly they are, you know, uh, sort of pivotal, um, you know, or real sort of apexes. Both of those pieces um, are, you know, really top trio um, works and some of our, our favorite. Um, of course, with, with everything, uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, this, you know, our whole world has, has kind of uh, been flipped topsy-turvy in the last month. I am Ukrainian. I do have people, um, that, family that, that, that live in the West. And, and just in the first week, you know, I mean, to make a long story short, one of the younger families with their four kids, or at least with, the, with all the kids younger than 21, the oldest one was in university and refused to leave and with her university friends has basically been barricading Lviv and making Molotov cocktails and probably spending a lot of time uh, on, on digital platforms, um, sort of combating all the propaganda and all. I mean, it's, it's been an, an amazing kind of effort all around. But the rest um, left for Germany. And long story short, a very good friend of ours, pianist Henrik Alpers, who is uh, one of the laureates of the uh, 206 uh, Honens competition, lives in Berlin. And I had sent him a, a video of this, of the 14 year old in this family playing because I thought, wow, she's pretty good. I sent the video to Jamie and to Henrik. I thought, well, you know, wow, this, I mean, this, she, she's playing some pretty tough stuff. I mean, I mean, it's family. So I don't know. I, I don't have the right yeah. filter to know if this person. And so I, you know, she's pretty good. And um, so Henrik had already been aware of this, of this, of uh, this Hannah. Uh, pianist. Anyhow, long story short, they the, Henrik and his wife have a country house, and they invited the family to come and live there. And they found a place for this 14-year-old uh, at the Dresden Academy for especially, you know, for for gifted musicians. And you know, that that happened in the first week, and then in the second week, it was other stuff. And 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 the whole time, um, I've been trying to track down our their very. I mean, somebody that we, we hold in, in such high esteem and I and consider a friend is composer Valentin Silvastrov. And as it happens, it was just earlier this afternoon that I finally spoke with him. And uh, yeah. he's in Berlin. Uh, and he, I mean, he was refusing to leave. Annalie and I have actually been, spent a bunch of hours with him in his little apartment studio and, you know, in a, in a Soviet, you know, era. Um, oops. Uh, uh, Soviet era building um, and um, his sanctuary for you know throughout the 70s 80s and into the early 90s when the you know when the collapse of the Soviet Union gave uh, Ukraine its independence and he was able to again resume his life um, a public life as a composer which he had withdrawn from because in the early 70s the composers union and the government were putting pressure on him to conform to you know their their stylistic norms and that wasn't interesting to him but I spoke with him today um, and he's just he's exhausted I think a of course because he's not home and they're very worried about home but he's just being you know sought after on a daily basis now that he's in Berlin to sort of comment on all this his music is being played um, everywhere and, and I was sent actually as a as a uh, as a messenger uh, with a message sent with a message from the Oslo Philharmonic and we're kind of connected to those people um, who wanted me to accept, first of all share with him that they were going to be playing his seventh symphony on in September and and that they would very much like for him to attend and he accepted and that's very exciting for them and that's <laughs> it was fun to be able to facilitate that um, in any case he's uh, it um uh, he's an incredible artist and musician, and I think that his music is just such a perfect um, balm, you could say, contrast to all the noise 
um, that is happening in the world now and uh, in, in its various forms. I mean, it's very obvious, you know, in mm-hmm. Ukraine, but I mean, just in general, the noise, the, the bandwidth noise. I mean, he's right. going exactly in the other way and it's this quiet, mm, just amazing stuff. Yeah, I, uh, it sort of leads to my next question, actually. Uh, the Griffin Trio have recorded his piece, Fugitive Visions of Mozart, which you're going to be playing on Saturday night. Right. Roman, does this piece take on more significance, what, what with current events from now, as, to, as opposed to when you recorded it with the trio? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it, I think it's, it's always had a, a very special place in our hearts because we went, you know, he wrote it for us in response to those, our Mozart recordings. I mean, he's, he's not a, you know, the composers um, in North America and Europe are, are very much, um, you know, they're, they're accustomed to being commissioned and, 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 uh, you know, and that he's he's of an era where it just doesn't work like that. I mean, when mm-hmm. he was in the composer's union, he got a salary and he just wrote your job was to just write music, you know, occasionally for a special occasion. But for the most part, you know, uh, when inspiration hit um, and so he was. I don't know. We had a very nice first meeting and he was kind of taken. He didn't know if something would come flying out of his head, but he was so excited when that when Mozart inspired him. So, um, yes, that happened. Um, And now, of course, to play that music and to I mean, again, I I think knowing that the music and that 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 his whole um, uh, sort of philosophy if you might, um, is just such a, a counter to everything. I mean, I think he was sort of way ahead of his time as he was developing this quiet music, as he calls it, or meta music, meta music, because he, he says, you know, his belief is that, or that, that there aren't any new sounds. Yeah, composers aren't making new sounds. I mean, all they're doing is just kind of grab, they're just grab, you know, they're, they're pro- reprocessing things that they've already heard and, you know, things that you've already heard. I mean, imagine, you know, like sounds of Mozart floating around from the first moment that they were created and, 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 and those sounds were inspired to. I mean, it, it is very moving. It's going to be even more moving knowing that uh, I spoke with him today and that he's in good shape and in Berlin. And I think that it provides uh, a really interesting contrast. I mean, you know, Shostakovich, you know, had to endure, uh, you, I mean, a whole other level kind of, you know, given that, that he had risen to the top of the composer's union and during his time was sort of the, the point person for all composers um in 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 russia i mean he had to endure a very you know the difficult you know tyranny and oppression and somehow from those constraints you know created this incredible piece um that we will be sharing with audiences Mm -hmm. um james that one of the big major works on the program is shostakovich's second piano trio i'm always fascinated with this piece because it was written during the Second World War, 1944, and the war definitely influenced this music. And yet he wrote it as a memorial to his friend Ivan Solartinsky. And I, mean, I think a piece of music, when you're going to write a memoriam piece, you think it's going to be, you know, lush and some maybe somewhat slow. And the second piano trio isn't that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, interestingly, the whole the whole structure of the piece is quite unusual. I mean, <clears throat> you know, typically the first movement of a is in, in what in in a, in a sort of a specific structure we call it sonata form, and and this mm-hmm. he starts off with a fugue, and he starts off, you know, with the cello way up there, and then the piano way down there, and then the violin low, you know. So he's he's already sort of throwing all expectations out the window with with the opening. Um, the second movement is sort of like a, kind of a crazy dance like movement, you know, but it's almost like, you know, literally you got a gun to your head. Okay, do a happy dance because I'm, I'm giving you two minutes to live. You know, it's, yeah. it's got that kind of frenetic energy. And then I think the third movement is maybe where a lot of the grief over his friend's death comes into play. It's a very, I mean, the piano just plays the same sequence of chords a handful of times and over top of that, the strings weave these, I mean, really, really expressive, you know, devastating melodies over top of that. Um, And then the last movement is really, I think the the portrayal of the war. I mean, you know, there's something way off in the distance that just comes closer and closer and just, you know, completely, 
just overwhelms everything in its path. And that's very much like this, you know, the kind of, you know, military machine that we associate with World War II. And, and then, and then almost like, um, you know, we'll never know until we go if, is there that flashback? Do we have that life flashback before death? Right. You know? And so what happens is at the end of this last movement, we get this kind of flashback. We get, we get some of the, that that fugue subject from the first movement but but it's very fast and frenetic and and we hear little bits from other movements kind of thrown in and so it has this kind of flashback effect and then at the very end of the piece it ends with a major chord and so there is this kind of hope for the future which of course has so far not been borne out but uh, but there is still even with even with Shostakovich even with the death of his friend and and witness witnessing war there is still just that flicker of hope that, you know, hope maybe we can figure this out and get along and, but clearly not yet. So, so that's kind of a synopsis, I think, of the piece. Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. if I can just add, yeah, I mean, sure. I think that, you know, I think that the piece and just the way it turned out, I think um, serves um, as a, as a great um, kind of memento of, of the relationship of the friend, deep friendship they had, that deep trust he had, uh, in Solertinsky, you know, these were times where, um, you know, to have a confidant in the way that that uh, Shostakovich had in in Solertinsky was was a very, you know, was a very rare gift, and I think that Solertinsky served as a, um, you know, allowed you know provided Shostakovich some feedback and some response and allowed him the opportunity. Um, to work through the deep frustrations and anxieties um, that the the whole political situation there imposed on him, and I think in in response to all of that, I mean, he created this, you know, this this piece with its four panels, and I'd say each one of them um, is just, I mean, it's perfect. There isn't a it there isn't an, an extra note there to be had, and it it has this amazing arc. It's a devastating thing. Um, and, um, and yet it, I mean, it's, it's, it really feels, I mean, it's, it, it, um, taps into, you know, all, um, that life really, I think, you know, brings to us in a way it's concentrated, yeah. forgive me, uh, it's concentrated in a way. Um, if I knew how to turn my phone off, I did uh, <laughs> that I'm in the process of doing so. Um, the alarm is trying to tell me that I shouldn't be late for this interview. Irony. Um, <laughs> in any case, um, that's there's and you know it, it, it's it's there's something about watching a trio play that piece as well because it it really mm -hmm. requires that we um, really kind of just leave ourselves behind and commit every ounce of energy and expressivity and control and power um, that we have. Um, it demands it that plus more than than we have to give. So to just sort of see that is something. And then, you know, that it'll be, a, as I said, an amazing contrast to play that. Yeah. And then play, you know, these six movements of the Silvestrov and Boy, I would sure love to be in the audience for that whole experience. It's going to be very special for us, but I, boy, that could be some. Mm -hmm. And then to play this Archduke, <laughs> which is just this, you know, phenomenal expression of of love and gratitude yeah. and an expression of friendship. You know, it, it's. I was I was going to ask. It's put after the intermission, and so I I have visions of you guys like going backstage, eating some turkey, having some bananas, you know, just sort of <laughs> chilling out and sort of forgot to ask about the turkey <laughs> and, and just sort of resetting, uh, you know, for, for the Mozart, uh, James, what does that take? Like, what do you have to, like, what kinds of things does the trio need to take in, into account when they're making the transition from the Shostakovich, which is intense to the Beethoven, which is the opposite. Well, you know, it's, you know, I, I think, you know, whenever we come, whenever we come back to the Archduke and it's been, you know, it's been a little while since we played it. It's, it's like seeing an old friend say, Hey, you know, good to see you, man. And, you know, we, <laughs> we get, and we get to spend over a half hour with a good friend, you know? So, so that's, you know, it's that, that'll, that'll be, that'll be fine. You know, it's, um, you know, it's a piece we've played a lot and, and the piece we've loved a lot. And uh, it, um, you know, sometimes look, I mean, we, we were just sort of talking about this earlier, you know, with just all the, 
dealing with travel, you know, like, especially in winter and, and then, you know, and getting PCR or rack tests and, you know, just all the stuff that you got to do to, to play a concert today, you know, actually sitting down at the, for me, sitting down at the piano, sometimes that's just, that is like the easiest part of my day, you know, because, because that's what we do. That's what we've been mm-hmm. trained to do. That's what we love doing. That's what we have enormous experience doing. So sometimes, you know, just sitting down playing the concert while of course, obviously it's taking a lot of energy and focus and so forth. In some ways it's, it's, it's a relaxing and enjoyable part of our day because we can sort of turn all that noise off, all the extracurricular, all the other stuff, admin stuff, you know, and just, just immerse in the music. So, you know, and I, and, and as, you know, as we might have referred to, I mean, this is a piece that speaks to, you know, the great kind of friendship that you can have between a musician and a supporter, you know, and that's really what uh, we're talking about with Harry. I mean, here's somebody who has supported the careers and opened the ears of Winnipeggers to so much great music and great performers over the decades, you know, and, um, and so this is very much like what the relation, relationship between Beethoven and the Archduke Rudolf was. Here's a guy. Yes, he was sort of nobility, but more right. important, he was a friend. He was an amateur musician. He would take lessons with Beethoven. They would have drinks. And and then, you know, Beethoven's thinking, oh, you know, I'm not making enough money. I got to leave Vienna. I said, oh, I'll get you some salary. And, yeah. you know, so it was really, really just this wonderful friendship. And the great reward for the Archduke's memory is that, I mean, really, as long as we know the name Beethoven, we will know the name Rudolf because, you know, because Beethoven dedicated all sorts of pieces right. to him. And, uh, and so that's, they, they will go down together in history. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, any tricks for playing the million and one notes in the final moment of the Archduke? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Espresso. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Lots that, of espresso. That, that <laughs> final movement because it's a lickety split. Uh, yeah. The last piece I want to talk about, and uh, I don't know if we can talk about it or not. Uh, can we touch on that Benuk Wajirodny piece, uh, mm-hmm. Roman? What can you what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, Dinuk, uh, we were very fortunate that uh, he had uh, he had heard us play some tangos, um, the, the the piazzola tangos, not any tangos, but those those pieces are just they're such a wonderful they provide such an a, a incredible opportunity for conversation in that you know amongst players in a chamber music kind of way and um we would been out east and um he actually he he wanted he he wanted i mean he was kind of you know uh, hustling i mean he wanted to create pieces and he wanted to create one for us and on that he came to a concert and we played some some tangos i remember that um, and then he just went off and he won a grant from the city of Halifax um, to write a piece for us. And he just went right ahead and wrote Love Triangle. And it was, I mean, it's its one of our you know, most popular works now. I mean, we played it in South Texas last weekend and, and you know, people just jumped out of their seats after. It was great. I mean, just, they just loved it. Anyhow, Jamie, why, Jamie has a nice, nice way of, of giving you a sense of what it's all about. Well, yeah, I mean, some of the things that uh, Danook incorporates in, in Love Triangle, he, because he has this this sort of wonderfully eclectic background, I mean, he was, you know, born in Sri Lanka and then grew up in Dubai and studied in Manchester and went to Toronto and to the East Coast and then to Ottawa now, where where he's a, a new professor <clears throat> at University of Ottawa. Um, so he incorporates some East, Eastern, Western things. So there'll be passages where two of us play this kind of... Um, there's these kind of hypnotic patterns and then the third person will have this solo that's just sort of free flowing above and so it sounds kind of improvised because it's not to be played with the other two so we each have moments like that and then you know the strings will have that kind of beautiful they'll do some pitch bending and so you get this really kind of exotic sound like you're all kind of you know, in a tent in the desert and somebody's maybe smoking something, you know, it's, it's, it's got this sort of wonderfully hypnotic uh, kind of feel to it. it. And it's, um, it's, it's really, and he's also got some really exciting, I mean, he knows how to write, you know, for, for effect. I mean, he was, you know, a pianist who toured with Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road Ensemble, right? So, I mean, he's, you know, he's top shelf, you know, pianist, composer, conductor, you know, and so, so there's some really wonderfully, you know, you know, sort of uber romantic moments in it and, and just a super exciting ending. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a really great piece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to wrap the, the conversation up this way. I know you're on the road. I think you're going to be in Boise in a few days. I was in a week. Uh, yeah, and your, yeah, uh, your, your website. Uh, any recording projects uh, coming up? Well, one thing we've got, uh, we've actually got the Brahms, the oh, big yeah. Brahms shows that we've been playing for a long time and just never quite got around Thank to you. recording. So we Thank finally, you. we've finally got those recordings. So they're, they're in post-production and hopefully will be coming out um, you know, until for our 30th year anniversary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> amazing amazing uh roman and james this has just been so great to talk uh, talk to both of you and thanks for taking the time to chat with me today the concert on saturday at 7 30 at st andrews united church is going to be just fantastic as always thanks again great, Thank great you, to Chris. speak with you see everybody on saturday